Hello. My name is Leonardo De Chirico. I come from Rome, where I pastor a church, and I'm glad to be with you all. I am the only one non-native English speaker of the panel. So I hope you will bear with my uh, Italian accent. My topic is uh, justification by faith, uh, looking especially at the challenges that we have in confronting a world where this word and the concept and the reality around it is also used by other theological, denominational, and spiritual traditions, namely the Roman Catholic Church and liberal churches. What does it mean for us to uh, preach justification by faith in such a diverse and contest contested context? I want to start by reading <coughs> a uh, passage from Romans, Romans 3, verses 21 to 30. This is the word of God. The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in, in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from works of the law? Or is he God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. The historic evangelical understanding of the gospel stands on two pillars. On the one hand, the authority of scripture as God's word written, and on the other, on justification by grace alone through faith alone. Our Protestant forefathers spoke about these two pillars as the formal principle of the Christian faith, the authority of scripture, and the material principle of the Christian faith. That is justification by grace alone, through faith alone. Scripture is the norm of the Christian life. Justification is the ground of it. Without the norm of Scripture, our lives are shaped by false standards and deceived by false narratives. Without the ground of justification, our lives are built on sinking sand and will ultimately collapse under the righteous judgment of God. In J.I. Packer's lucid way of condensing biblical teaching, justification is, quote, God's act of remitting the sins of and reckoning righteousness to ungodly sinners freely by his grace, through faith in Christ, on the ground not of their own works, but of the representative righteousness and substitutionary blood shedding of Jesus Christ on their behalf. This is Packer. Historically, justification has been the landmark of the evangelical faith since the times of the apostles. The church fathers maintained it 
And while it was not their main concern, they fully endorsed it. The Reformation did not invent it. Simply, it restated it in more biblical and coherent terms in times in which it had been obscured by medieval opacity. Reformed and Lutheran orthodoxy embraced it wholeheartedly. Giants like Jonathan Edwards and the British Puritans preached it with full conviction. German pietism shaped its spirituality around it. Great preachers like Spurgeon made justification by faith central to his preaching and that pattern continued up to the times of John Stott and Martin Lloyd-Jones. Even Billy Graham's message fully stands within the parameters set by justification by faith. The sinner is saved by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from good works, without any merit on our part. The Lausanne Covenant, 1974 Lausanne Covenant, confirms this evangelical consensus throughout the course of history. This has been the fundamental mark of the biblical faith throughout the centuries because it lies at the heart of the biblical gospel. However, there have been two strong reactions against justification by faith. One coming from the Roman Catholic Church, the other coming from the liberal theological tradition. On the one hand, the Roman Catholic Church violently rejected it at the Council of Trent, 1544-1562. Trent continued to use the word justification, but filled it with a completely different meaning using the same word, but changing the basic meaning. For Trent, justification was a process rather than an act. And it was a process initiated by the sacrament of baptism, whereby the church mediated God's grace to the newborn baby in terms of giving him, infusing the first installment of God's grace in a church act. A process nurtured by the religious works of the faithful and sustained by the sacramental system of the church. A process needing to go through a time of purification in purgatory before perhaps, perhaps being enacted on judgment day. Rome reframed and reconstructed justification in terms of a combination of God's initiative and man's efforts. A combination of grace and works joined together resulting in an ongoing journey of justification ultimately dependent on human works and ecclesiastical sacraments. What was missing at Trent and since Trent in the Catholic teaching was the declarative forensic act of justification. That is the fact that justification is an act of God, not something that we do or we contribute to. It's something that comes from our God as an act, forensic, judicial expression of God on us. And it also missed the exclusive grounding in divine grace, leading to missing the full assurance of being justified because of what God the Father had declared, God the Son had achieved, and God the Spirit had worked out. Trent came up with a confused and confusing teaching on justification that has been misleading people since. Not rejecting the word, but taking the word and reframing it, giving it 
an altogether different meaning. So we use the same word, but we have to understand that we have different meanings. The other objection to the evangelical doctrine of justification by faith alone came from theological liberalism since the 19th century. In this case, too, the word justification was maintained, but again, the meaning of it was totally undermined and eventually redefined. By rejecting the biblical doctrine of sin as a tragic separation from God and rebellion against God, liberalism objected to the need for justification. According to liberalism, our problem is not so much us being sinner in the hands of a righteous God, but our task is to be righteous people as human beings, imitating the good example of the perfect righteous man, Jesus Christ, the man, Jesus Christ, wanting to imitate him, wanting to become righteous, humanly righteous, as he was righteous in his human dealings. No atonement is needed, no sin is to be forgiven, no judgment is previewed. The liberal vision is to create a world where self-defined righteous people attempt to build a would-be righteous society marked by universal human brotherhood. This culture of self-righteousness has been damaging the Western churches and society to the point of making them implode under the weight of unrealistic and false illusions. So why evangelical Protestants have always advoca advocated for justification, making it central in their preaching, pastoral practices, and missionary endeavors for centuries? There have been at least two accounts of justification that have offered alternative readings of it. Now, besides their differences, both the Catholic and the liberal versions of justification significantly converge, overlap, in presenting an inflated view of man's ability to do something for one's own salvation, whatever salvation means for them. They, have, they both have an inflated view of man's ability and uh, a defective view of sin. Of course, if you have a, an inflated view of man, you have a deficient, defective view of sin and therefore a rejection of Christ's atonement, taking our place, paying for the righteousness of God on our behalf. And also they share, the, the Catholic and the liberal versions of justification, an uneasiness towards everything related to God's justice and judgment. It is no surprise that in 1999, these Catholic and Protestant liberal accounts of justification merged together into the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification signed by the Catholic Church and some Lutherans, most of them liberals. They were already close enough to finally come to the point of drafting a joint statement. The non-tragic view of sin is shared by both Catholic and liberal views. The necessity of the sacramental system of the Church is what the Catholic part insists on in the document. While the liberal emphasis on the universal, universalist scope of justification is underlined by the liberals. All are and eventually be justified because in the end, God will have mercy on all. This is in summary, the joint declaration 
on the doctrine of justification. God, in the end, will save everyone. This is the present-day common understanding of justification shared by both the Catholic Church and the liberal churches. Next year, 2017, these two bodies will celebrate the fact that the Reformation is over. In celebrating or remembering uh, the fifth centenary of the beginning of the Reformation, they are ready to tell the world that the Reformation is over. And if justification is what they say it is, they are right. It is over indeed. Moreover, the present Pope, Pope Francis, has chosen the word mercy to define his message and his overall view of the Christian faith. According to him, mercy is at the heart of the gospel. But what kind of mercy is he talking about? It is an atonement free, judgment less, conscience centered, Marian oriented type of mercy. Atonement free, judgment less, conscience centered, Marian oriented type of mercy. A kind of mercy that is silent on sin and superficial on repentance. As it was the case with justification, it is the same biblical word that is used, mercy. But it is used not in its biblical meaning. Watch out, brothers and sisters, they are using the same words that the gospel use. Grace, faith, cross, mercy, gospel. But they have redefined their meaning and the overall message is fundamentally different. This is the challenge for our present day generation. Dealing with people talking with the same kind of language that we use but meaning an altogether different message. What is close is a kind of phonetic resemblance. We use the same words, we use the same sounds, grace, cross, cross gospel, mercy, but there is a theological gulf. And so we have to test all spirits, according to the Bible, going beyond what appears to be a commonality, making sure that we understand what is at stake when they use these words. How are then we to plan churches in such a context? The Church of Christ will continue to be founded on the authority of Scripture and justification by faith. There is no other recipe, so to speak, available for a healthy gospel church. There is no other gospel than the biblically attested message of Jesus Christ who saves unworthy sinners like us on the ground of his one and for all work on the cross. We may and should be creative to find new and better ways to explain what justification by faith means, to preach it, to apply it, to witness its living reality. But the Bible is crystal clear that we, either, we are either justified by God's grace or we fall in a kind of deceptive self-justification. That is a tragic lie. Any accommodation to the idea that we are ultimately capable of saving ourselves any accommodation to the fact that salvation is not God's gift from beginning to end is a slippery slope towards a false gospel. Do not think that justification is a theological relic of a distant past. It is indeed key to grasp the good news of Christ. 
May all church planters wholeheartedly embrace what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3. I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but by which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Let's plant churches in Europe that faithfully and passionately reflect and embody this gospel. Amen. Amen.